Ladies and gentlemen, I'd like to uh, call our meeting to order again. The Port Commission has been meeting in executive session, and so we call our meeting back together. No decisions were made at that time. We call our meeting back together at this time. So thank you for standing. We'll do a Pledge of Allegiance right now. I pledge, pledge allegiance to, to the flag of the United States, States of America, America to, to the republic, republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Please be seated. We are. Our first item, it's nice to see everyone here today, and our first item on the agenda is both a happy and sad one. Tong, Ju? Yes. Thank you, Commissioner. Well, today, uh, to me, is definitely a bittersweet moment. Um, on the one hand, we are all very excited for our Susan as she takes on a new challenge in her career. But we're also losing a leader, an important member of the extended Port of Tacoma family, and someone we all are going to miss very much. Susan was appointed Director of Terminal Operations for APMT back in October 2010. I still remember meeting her for the very first time three years ago. I had prepared myself mentally uh, for my first encounter with this rough and tumble female <laughs> terminal manager. And I believe any woman who has what it takes to manage a marine terminal has to be tough and possibly a little uh, rough around the edges, uh, for there are very, very few women in the industry who have what it takes to advance to the senior position at a large container terminal. Well, I was right and I was wrong. Um, I was thinking this lady must be one tough customer. That proved to be right. <laughs> <laughs> then Susan walked in, a beautiful lady uh, who dressed very smartly and talked worldly, traveled extensively throughout the world for work and, and also for pleasure, and radiated with confidence and um, determination. After working with Susan and getting to know her, I'm convinced that I now know the key ingredients for Susan's success. It is her honesty to her team, loyalty to her organization, and her dedication and leadership skills. It is my pleasure to invite Susan to the podium for acknowledgement from our commission for the fine work she has done in her tenure with at and here in Tacoma. Thank you, Tong. Um, I, uh, it is a bittersweet moment for me, too. I think uh, I think I work for the best con container operator in the world right now with APMT, and uh, I wouldn't leave this company after 18 years to just go work for another stevedore. Um, not to say that they aren't great, but why would I do that? Um, so I'm going on to work for Navis, which is a, also the best terminal operations software provider company in the world. and. Uh, just super excited to, to go work for a different company and go back to the East Coast where my family is, which is which is great for me. And um, in my new role, I'll be traveling quite a bit, so I'm sure I'll run into some of you guys in the airports uh, between here and there. And um, I'm just really excited, but I think um, one of the things I was really proud of being here is that I was here for a long time in comparison to most terminal directors that have run this terminal. And um, a lot of cooperation with John and, and Tong. And, Don and, and Lewis, I see, has shown up in the back, and um, we've, we've had a lot of challenging times, and we really hope to have gotten the Grand Alliance at our facility, but it went to Woods, so at least that was a victory uh, here in Tacoma, and we, just, we saw this victory as well. So um, I just want to thank John and his team for welcoming me three years ago, and I look forward to what happens in the future. So. Susan, thank you. Thank you so much. I'd, I'd like to invite the other commissioners to say something, and then we do have a small gift for you. Oh, thank you. Fun? Well, yeah, just real quick, I, I wish you nothing but the best in, in your endeavors. I know we'll see each other as time goes on because our interests are the same a lot. And thank you for all the work and dedication you did for AMT. I know it's a tough business, as you know, uh, but I appreciate everything you did. Okay. Congratulations. Thank you again. And 
and I hope you enjoy going home. Yeah. And not constantly be on an airplane. Yeah. yeah. Well, I think I'll be on a plane more than I was in this job. So. <laughs> yeah, most likely. <laughs> Sue, it's, it's just great to see a woman like you achieve what you've achieved, and you really set um, uh, an example for other women coming along in the industry, and so we all wish you the best, and uh, going home is part of the best, so yeah. good for you. Thank you. And I would just like to say congratulations, and uh, unlike the rest of them, wish you nothing but best, the best, because you, you I think, uh, along with the team over there, have made a good mark on Tacoma, and thank you. Yeah. Well, Susan, we have something very small for you, and you said you're going to be traveling a great deal, so <laughs> we think that you might be a golfer or you might not, but we definitely hope that you'll wear this when you come back to visit us during the U.S. Open. Oh, great. Okay, sure. so <laughs> let's, uh, let's uh, all come down. Can everybody join me, and we'll take have a little photograph, a goodbye photograph with you. One of many, I'm sure. Yeah. <laughs> Well, that's Thursday's my last day. So, Thank you very, very much. Um, let's move ahead with our agenda then at this time. We begin with our consent agenda, which is the approval of the minutes of January 8th and the check certifications at that time. Do I have a motion to accept those items? So moved. Second. Second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? All right. Thank you very much. The motion is carried for the consent agenda. The first, uh, the next item on our consent agenda is the Intergovernmental Personnel Act Assignment Agreement with National Marine Fisheries Service. <coughs> Jason Jordan, did you want to make any comments about that, or would you just like us to pass that? Maybe just want to say like just, 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 just pass it. Tell us what we're We've definitely read it. This is an agreement that's been in place for a number of years, and because of the new administrative uh, rule, we, we get to approve it again. Yes, that's exactly it. Commissioner, I'm happy to answer any questions you might have as a result Great. of that. Great. Thank you. I don't know if there are questions, and if not, I'll take a motion to include that as part of this so consent moved. agenda. Second. All right. Thank you very much. Those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Thank you. Thank you very much. Then the first uh, item officially on our agenda, Al Worth, I'd like to invite you to come forward, Lewis, um, to discuss the safety program at the Port of Tacoma. Well, commissioners, good Lewis. afternoon. I'm not Al Worth. I know. But, Lewis, uh, it's good to see you. <laughs> but it is my pleasure to introduce uh, Mr. Worth uh, uh, to you. Um, Al Worth joined uh, the Port of Tacoma team just four months ago. Uh, and uh, he's joined as our manager of safety programs. Uh, Al has extensive experience in both uh, uh, public and industrial uh, safety and health. Uh, he was previous, previously working in a similar capacity overseeing uh, industrial safety programs at multiple power generation plants for a private uh, um, uh, electrical utility in northern Nevada. Concurrently, he was also a, a, a trainer at, uh, uh, on the faculty of the uh, Nevada State uh, Fire Training Academy. Uh, he brings to the port a deep knowledge of uh, industrial safety uh, standards and best practices. And uh, in the time that he's been with us, uh, we've also come to appreciate his, his passion, his creativity, and while I suspect it won't be on display here, he's got a pretty good sense of humor as well. Um, he's already begun uh, reviewing extensively the port's uh, existing program and making improvements. and. Uh, it seems now is, would be a very suitable time uh, to, uh, to ask you to, uh, to review and, and uh, adopt a restatement of the port's uh, safety resolution. And uh, Al will be doing, making that request in the context of an update 
uh, one of uh, what we believe is several uh, about the, the, uh, the status of the port's uh, safety program. And with that, I'd like to invite Al up to the podium. Thank okay. you. Thank you very much, Al. Welcome, welcome to the Port of Tacoma, a little belatedly. Sure. We're very glad to have you here and to hear the changes you're making. Thank you. Good afternoon. It's an honor to be here, and I wish to thank you for your time. I'm also honored to see some of the, my distinguished colleagues and representatives of Local 22, 28, and 23 present in these chambers. Um, thank you, Dean McGrath, Dax. I see you're out there, Dax Coho, Dave Field. Uh, Devron Found, and I'd like to also mention that one of my co-workers who's been a, a great help to me in the transition uh, here at the port is Anthony uh, Judy, who's uh, sitting at the back of the room. So thank you, and uh, I appreciate you taking the time to, uh, to in, engage me on this uh, presentation. The presentation that I'm about to provide will provide an overview of the requested uh, resolution in the context of the port safety programs. Um, is this on? I'll just resort to this. We are having technical difficulties here. That always happens on first presentation. First time. Exactly. <laughs> We do I'm getting broken in real well here. <laughs> we it's it actually a test. <laughs> <laughs> Technical support here. If you make it through today, you're good. Okay. Good to well, go. I'll give you a little bit of background. Um, you know, we acknowledge here that um, efficient and reliable operations are dependent upon a uh, safe and healthful work environment. When accidents occur, of course, costly uh, disruptions to the work environment occurs, and uh, that takes us off our primary tasks. Resolution 201401 amends the prior resolution, which was adopted by the Port Commission in 1990. The passage of time and advancements in best practices relative to health and safety prompts the restatement of this policy. Also, I'd like to call your attention to uh, that in 2012, the Port Commission adopted the Port's strategic uh, plan, which called for a reduction of employee injuries through employee engagement, along with increasing our organizational capabilities. Our program's objectives can be pretty much summarized as follows. Um, Achievement of these objectives requires healthy employee engagement, along with confirming that the right way to work is the safe way to work and that there's no other way to do so. Our goals, of course, are to reduce incidents, including fewer recordable lost time injuries and fewer damage incidents as well. The question is, what is it that we need to enjoy a successful and safe workplace? There are seven components to this and I'll briefly uh, comment on those seven. A shared commitment, and this commitment is from the top all the way through all layers of our organization. That commitment is employees, workers, management, all committed to the same goal towards safety. Having plans and procedures in place that are established and essentially statutory is essential, and that those plans are accessible to all employees so that they can reference that material. Training is an essential component. Uh, along with that, incident analysis. And I'll be talking a little bit about incident analysis and using the term root cause analysis. This is an industry standard that's been adopted in many institutions, and it gets to the heart of a number of factors that uh, contribute towards accidents and accident prevention. Compliance, of course, has to do with compliance with regulatory <coughs> compliance in OSHA, WISHA standards, and also with policy uh, adherence internally as well. Corrective actions are generally taken, but they should be taken as a result of a proactive root cause analysis performed on incidents so that repeat uh, offenses or occurrences are limited. And then last but not least, performance tracking. And performance tracking is done 
through a number of different matrices, specifically key performance indicators, which I'll, I'll talk about in just a minute as well. Before you, I have a copy of this resolution, and um, you know I know the folks in the back of the room cannot see this. The, we could make some additional copies available, but essentially I will break down those components of that uh, in this presentation. Okay, the resolution states that safety is a shared responsibility. It involves all levels of management, supervision, and labor. It states that employees, compliance with apl applicable codes and standards and best practices will be taken uh, into consideration and applied. All employees have a duty to work safely. The resolution also states that we are to look out for the safety of our coworkers, uh, contractors, and visitors on the port. Essentially, we are our brothers and sisters keepers, and we have to take that approach. The resolution states, no persons will be instructed nor allowed to work in any unsafe manner. No shortcuts, no compromises. Use of personal protective equipment, PPEs, is mandated. Comprehensive written safety policies and procedures, again, are available and uh, soon will be posted on our website. Employee training programs, the heart of the program, this entire program is training. Training has to be available and uh, in many cases refresher training has to be conducted on a periodic basis. Some of the plans and procedures, I'm not going to read these off, you can see them on the screen. Can you folks in the back see this as well? Might be a little difficult. Oh, okay, you can see that. I know I can't with my prescription, but uh, here's just a partial list of some of those. Currently, we're running at about uh, 32 programs under safety with the Port of Tacoma. In 2013, we already started a program called BEST, Basic Employee Safety Training. We expanded that to include um, all new employees and eventually the current employees at the port will go through refresher training in that to raise the level of awareness and the expectations of all employees. Computer-based training, uh, CBT as we often refer to it, conducted through Granger Incorporated, is uh, one of the things that we've adopted and it's going to be going uh, port-wide very soon. Currently the prototype or the beta was run through the uh, maintenance department under uh, Kevin Zinsky and uh, Bruce and Kate, and they've been very successful in the implementation of that. Hazardous waste operations, HAZMAT and HAZWOPPER training has been conducted, and hearing conservation program has been put into place. Audiometric testing, which was conducted and coordinated through the port and uh, coordinated by Anthony Judy, has been completed as well. The first quarter of 2014, we're going to have, we have had fall recovery and retrieval training already. And anything you see in check boxes, to include a few that haven't been checked, have been conducted already. Today, transportation of hazardous materials is going on at the port, um, as in today. Um, it's been facilitated. Uh, lockout tagout is being conducted next week. Could you um, explain that, please? Yes, what's well, that? That's not a new program. We've done lockout tagout before, have we not? Correct, and it's just being enhanced and, uh, and uh, some of the updates. So how do you enhance lockout? You do it a, co a combination of ways. One, of course, uh, there's computer-based training available to employees, but any additional changes in policy and also updates through uh, the Washington Administrative Codes along with OSHA are added to that. It's facilitated as well. Uh, there are certain types of training that, you know, you can get it didactically through the computer and through lecture, but that doesn't always work. Hands-on training, facilitated. I've been, I've been, my background with, with lockout, that's pretty straightforward, pretty simple. The question is who cuts a lock if somebody leaves? But uh, lockout tag-in is, is not a, uh, a, a huge, do we have problems with lockout tag-out in, in the port? 
We've had a couple of uh, misunderstandings that related uh, to lockout tag out and resulted in a few citations. So how do you have a misunderstanding? Policies and procedures, dissemination, updates and that, just uh, communicating it across the board. I, I, my only, that, that is my yeah. background. I'm, I'm, right. I'm not aware of any confusion on a lockout tag out. Yeah. There, when I when I came no, into the uh, excuse. Yeah. yeah. You know, you can help me out. What is what does that mean? Lockout tag out essentially is is to um, to withhold hazardous energy um, from in machinery or electrical operations so that employees working downstream uh, of that energy will not be harmed. Sometimes it's turning off uh, systems and then locking them so that they cannot be reinstituted and it's the control of any hazardous energy such as hydraulic pneumatic air uh, electrical it's not limited to it it's chemicals as well when you say lockout tag out you don't substitute tag out for lockout though no we do not there is a, a distinction to that lockout tag out is the combination of the two an information tag okay. associated with it a lock is a physical barrier and that's primary and that's primary. What's a tryout? Tryout is uh, referred to as like a bump test. Okay, sometimes you have to temporarily remove the lockout or tagout mechanisms in order to calibrate a machine or to realign it for diagnostic testing or alignment or calibration, uh, a number of things. And then you have to reapply that lockout tagout once you start reworking on the machine itself. So it's, a, it's kind of a diagnostic um, test when you're involved in that process. Mm -hmm. Thank you. So I, I, get, my, um, I, I like what you're saying verbally. Um, <laughs> if you go back far enough in time, a lot of people just tagged out. They didn't lock out. That is correct. In fact, in That's the power better. utility industry, yeah. A lot of that industry still is operating under tag out only, and um, very dangerous to make a mistake. Yeah. Yes, and people can get killed from this yeah. sort of thing. So, any more questions? Thank you. All right. Uh, so, in this uh, first quarter, you can see the training that we're uh, going to initiate and have. It's it's scheduled. Uh, first aid, CPR, bloodborne pathogens is being. Uh, conducted uh, respiratory protection, confined space awareness, entry and operations, um, and also root cause analysis. As we, uh, as we address some of the injuries and accidents, we also subsequently train those who have to enter into the system what the process is all about first, and then we go to the root causes and publish those reports. Generated from those reports are action items, and they'll be tracking to follow up on those items to make sure they're implemented. So a question on that, I like that real cause. <clears throat> Sometimes the experience is we always find something to do from a physical standpoint instead of really, you know, thou shalt not trip as I walk across the parking lot. Yeah. Uh, so we'll repave the parking lot and forget that thou shalt not trip as we go across the parking lot. Correct. In fact, I'm going to expound on this just a little bit just for the, the benefit of anybody else who hasn't really heard about lockout, tag out. Excuse me, I have one more question on that. Yes, ma'am. Which is, I don't see anything there in terms of training relative to a crisis response as it applies to safety. Uh, actually, there will be that training coming up in the uh, not too distant future, sometime this year. Uh, do we have policies around that? Like, yes, we do. We have. Points and various things? Yes, ma'am. We've. Uh, We've got uh, a number of emergency plans and crisis response, uh, which are being developed by uh, Lewis Cooper and myself and the security staff. Is it written? It is written. I'd like a copy, please. Okay, we'll get you some of those plans. Okay, uh, the resolution, coming back to that, are there any more questions? Thank you. Okay, the resolution uh, also states that it. Uh, the port takes affirmative actions to discover and correct the violations of any safety rules, and the safety record is considered part of employees' performance evaluations. The resolution states that all significant accidents near miss shall be thoroughly investigated, 
and that there's an executive level inquiry or review of those root causes as well. Yeah. Can you uh, define executive level? Yes, sir. Um, what we've got is once a uh, root cause uh, or a phase two investigation has been completed and action items are developed, the employee gets together with the chief um, operating officer and he sits down with them and asks them how they felt about the root cause process, if there's anything that hasn't been covered. He also reviews the thoroughness and uh, the adequacy of the report that we present to them with the action items indicated. Okay, so the follow-up question is, what's the time frame between an incident and uh, the activation of the investigation? Well, you have two phases. You have the incident and immediately after the incident, when practical, you know, putting the employee in the ambulance if necessary, you know, takes precedence, life safety. But in tandem with that, you have the initial response, and that's when the accident investigation occurs. So that's immediate. Once that is completed and the employee is able to come back to work, that's when the phase two section of the investigation starts to kick in. And there may be a variance in times because of the employee's ability yeah, my to. My question would be, if um, that took four months, that's a lot. Of, that's a lot of dead time. It is. So, my, I guess my follow-up question: um, Who does the the initial injury investigation? The initial injury investigation is um, an effort between the supervisors of that employee and ports uh, port patrol. Okay. They, so they respond to that. They document what happened, where the uh, equipment was, positions of uh, equipment, and the nature of the overall accident. The uh, workers' comp forms go to risk management. I get uh, CC'd, included in that process. And then as soon as that employee is released to come back to work, that's when we do the phase two and the root cause analysis. But that could be a few months later, depending on It the could, in theory, yes. So my, yeah. my question then would be, does that provide the value? Having the employee there is a great idea to have um, for the investigation, but to do a root cause four months later, to exaggerate the point, uh, might not be as, as effective as having one for the yeah, next days. There's kind of a preliminary process in between that that kind of bridges that gap. And, but without the affected employee, you, you have to engage them and have their input as to their recollection of the events and uh, some of the occurrence of it. So between the initial investigation, what we do, if there's, um, you know, a protact, uh, you know, an extended period of time, then what we have to do is look at, uh, you know, safety alerts, abating the obvious hazards, and do as much diligence as we can towards root causing but a, an effective root cause really has to be done with the employees involved and affected people. When we talk about incident analysis, when we talk about root cause, I uh, call your attention to the weed, the roots, and the, uh, the iceberg here, okay? Typically, when an incident comes down, the, uh, the symptom of the problem just is, is uh, Mr. Johnson, you articulated the, um, the weed, which is the cause, is very obvious. The problem is in most places, or in a lot of them, they only go that far. And so they address the obvious contributing factors, but they don't get the underlying causes or the root. And just like an iceberg out there, you got a huge portion of potential missed opportunity underneath that can come back and reoccur and bite us. So the idea here is that where there's little or no harm, near misses of any significance, we want to address those as well. Because if we can exploit those near miss incidents and root cause those, perhaps we can prevent injuries and death as well. So that's uh, you know, the, the process in a nutshell. And it's an oversimplification, but uh, that's it. When I talk about inclusion and engagement, just as I pointed out, having the employee or the victim of the incident 
It draws upon the diverse skills and perspectives of those people in the workforce to be able to, to contribute to it, identify, and implement those corrective actions that we want to put into place. The resolution also um, states that uh, we'll actively engage with other groups in the industry to promote safe work practices in the uh, local maritime industry and other industries as well. Safety is a principal factor in new equipment purchases and the resolution states that key performance indicators are utilized to track that performance. And I'll talk about key performance indicators real briefly here. KPIs as we refer to them take into account a number of uh, factors. We've got recordable injury rates, lost time rates, compliance, training, and of course the root cause analysis that we perform. Um, our targets currently are listed right here. We'd like to have a recordable injury rate of less than two. Currently we are running at 5.87. Okay? Uh, our lost time injury rates, we'd like to have less than one. We're at about 1.73, and we have three uh, WISHA or uh, Department of Labor citations that we are currently dealing with. We'd like to have zero. Uh, the other uh, status on those results are still pending because we've got training to do and, uh, and of course, uh, some additional root causes. I, can I ask you one question there? I, yes, ma'am. I'm sorry, I don't mean to be obtuse, but how, if you have an injury rate, why isn't it a full number? What's a, what's a percentage of an injury? <laughs> Okay, those are based on calculations on the industry standard uh -huh. and um, basically what you do is you take into account an average of a hypothetical 100 employees uh -huh. times 2,000 hours, so you have 200,000 hours, and then you calculate those rates accordingly. Breaking it down into something more meaningful or easier for us to understand yeah. is something like this. Okay. okay, we have a total of 30 reported injuries right. here at the port. Out of those, 18 of them have occurred in the maintenance uh, facilities area. You know, um, five have occurred in operations, five have occurred in security, and two in administration. Breaking it down a little bit further, here's our recordable injuries. Now, recordable injuries are those injuries that are considered OSHA recordable requiring definitive care beyond simple first aid measures. So they have to go to a clinic, they have to get an x-ray, or you know, there's some other criteria associated with that. One, one comment on that. Yeah. Because um, I, I always got very upset when I had something in administration. Because if I sit behind the desk or walking around, that's a totally different risk pattern than if I'm in maintenance. Absolutely. Because a much higher degree of risks then it has a higher degree of risk than, than security, in my view, and it has a higher degree of risk than, than the office work. Yeah. And, um, so I, I'm somewhat, we had that proportional. I, I, it's difficult to do, I understand, but. Well, and, and part of addressing that is raising situational awareness. Yeah. You know, uh, everything from housekeeping to, you know, other factors. One of those injuries, I can tell you, is kind of like a phantom injury. We're not really sure what the cause of it was, but we had to put it down, so. This is the chair wrong. Yeah. Our compensable injuries for the port are five, okay? Um, of course, we've had two in maintenance that are compensable. Operations has had one and two have been in security. So that's kind of how it's broken down. Getting back to the resolution, our resolution states that tenants and contractors and consultants will comply with safety standards. Those will be written into contracts, and those will be established <coughs> understandings so that we don't have, say, uh, a tenant or a visitor or a contractor that comes onto our sites or works with us that is out of compliance because there is some vicarious liability associated with that. So we want to address those. Disaster and emergency preparedness goes to your point, uh, Commissioner. Yes, emergency preparedness in, in support of a network with agencies and also some more proactive plans are being developed. And we have uh, addressed some of those uh, since I've been here. Voluntary self-reporting of employees. I'm going to get on to that in a second. Um, employee incentive programs are being reviewed and regular updates to you, 
here at the commission will be performed as well and that's uh, that's uh, memorialized in this uh, resolution um, one of the things I wanted to point out with the voluntary employee self-reporting the uh, Federal Aviation Administration has for their flight crews something called a self-reporting system especially for pilots and what it is is if they get into a near-miss situation and they report it to the FAA as a mistake that they did on their own part or they observed it what it does is it's a non-punitive uh, notification they, they essentially have indemnity from any kind of punitive action because the idea is to get the word out hey I did something wrong maybe some of you guys are doing this wrong or I just discovered something get the word out through a corporate safety alert or a port wide safety alert so that we don't have reoccurrences of those near misses as well so that's what the uh, the comment within the uh, resolution addresses for these reasons I request that you authorize the adoption of this resolution and uh, just one more thing I wanted to say I thank uh, the representatives of local 23 28 and 22 for uh, their participation in uh, reviewing the drafts of this resolution and also their comments in us being able to uh, put it together and uh, if you have any additional questions I thank you for your time thank you very much I'd like to entertain a motion for the adoption of this resolution so and second sir. second thank you very much and now I'd like to ask for questions and comments from the Commission just a real quick comment and I think you, you touched on it right at the end there I you know safety is a, a, a major uh, Topic that we should all be aware of at all times and you can't do it unless all parties are involved and having the brothers and sisters from the various ILW locals along with management along with senior staff uh, making sure that people when they come to work go home to go home at the end of the day safe and sound and that's what we want as a commission I know that's what they want out there and, and we appreciate everything you're doing to ensure that that happens I'd like to follow up on, on uh, Dick's comment. Um, I think, from my perspective, safety is the one is the number one issue uh, before financial performance, before all the other stuff. Safety is the number one issue, and we should talk about it more. Um, people have to be held accountable for their actions, and we are all human beings. Uh, our pro safety programs need to address what's really happening to us, because sometimes our safety programs are such. But oh, wait, this is what's happening to us, as you are, as you are well aware. Um, but I had a, uh, an experience one time when a wife came up to me and says, "I've been nervous all my all my all my husband's career here because I wasn't sure he was going to come home at night," and that's a heck of a of a situation to have. And I can understand that. And everybody has a right to go home the same way they came to work. Uh, so we need to do whatever we need to do, whatever we need to do, we need to do so people can go home safely. Yeah. Thank you very much. Yes, yeah, I, I would like you to consider putting a bullet uh, under training relative to crisis response. Absolutely. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> first of all, I'm pleased to support this resolution because I think for what's been stated previously, the importance of this to all of us is very, very important. Having been involved with um, some other cases when I was with the port staff, <laughs> It's not a fun process when somebody's injured in the workplace. It, it is just not there. So, but a couple of things that I uh, I like uh, some of the concepts in this resolution. But I have to ask about where you're linking safety to uh, a person's performance evaluation. Are all of our employees evaluated annually? I believe they are. Yes. Okay. So there is a connection there. So everybody's being evaluated. Uh, the other piece is is that. When you talked about an employee incentive program, what do you mean by that? I mean, in terms of, is this a financial incentive or is this a, you know, what what do you mean when you say that? Yeah, there's there's different types of incentive programs. Um, you know, employee recognition for one, for doing things, uh, you know, the proper way safely. Um, what we used to call reverse citations that's where a person goes out a supervisor or a person like myself and they'll go out and observe uh, you know what type of work is being performed out in the field and if they see something particularly safe or a good habit they document that 
and they report it. And that person gets recognition for that. And recognition can fall in a number of forms, whether it's, uh, you know, in the form of a commendation, uh, you know, a statement made to their supervisor. To include, uh, say, you get a group that meets KPIs, key performance indicators, you know, um, everything from a barbecue, taking them out to lunch to, uh, you know, jackets. You see this kind of thing happen in uh, different work settings. And, uh, yeah. I think that's a great idea. because, But it needs to be a large group because the group of three that has an excellent record. Yeah. Uh, I, I go back in the risk. Maintenance has a much higher risk issue than office staff. Absolutely. So the reward program needs to represent the degree of risk that maintenance has. And the group that performs well needs to show, that's what I like about luck. A large group needs to put pressure on the other group that's not performing well. Because it's that peer pressure that helps people get along and still understand the, 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 the degree of risk. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And, and there are some incentive programs uh, that I've seen used across the country where, uh, say, your promotional companies where you get your jackets, sweaters, uh, things of that nature, um, the group accrues so many points that yeah. they can, you know, and pick I, an item from a menu or whatever. The I used to do it that way. But, you know, yeah. the real benefit is going home with all your parts. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. But, That's no, just the icing on the cake. The, the last comment I have is, is that I really like the idea of the self-reporting on near-miss accident, yeah, because the idea yeah. there is, is if you can make it safer for the next uh, person or the next incident. I really like that. I, I particularly like your your reference to the example where it's a no-fault type of a deal. I like that because I think that's how you can always promote a, a safer workplace. So thank you. Yeah, and there's also collateral uh, benefits to that, building up trust and and uh, some other things that come out of those as well. Very good. Thank you. Thank you for your time. Thank you. I'd like to know now, is there any comments or questions from the public on those who worked on the update to this uh, resolution with Mr. Ward? Anyone like to say anything? Yes. Hello, my name is Sarah Morkin and I live here in Tacoma and I, I wasn't planning on commenting about this particular part of the agenda but it seems re very relevant to what myself and, uh, and some of my fellow citizens of the South Sound came here to talk about, which was the oil trains. Um, I'm a, uh, I speak on a personal capacity as a shop steward with the United Food and Commercial Workers uh, and a healthcare worker as well. I work at Multicare. Um, we're concerned about the oil trains. Uh, you probably have to be living in a cave not to have seen the the uh, exploding oil trains on the news, and um, we're concerned because we we saw in the uh, strategic plan for the port that they're looking at oil, uh, crude oil, as an opportunity for the port, and uh, this would could propose uh, pose uh, increased safety hazard to the workers in the port. Um, you said that uh, safety is your number one issue, and uh, one concern is that if there were some sort of fossil fuel explosion in in the port, uh, the didn't the uh, number six fire station close this year? Um, and uh, so there's no there's not a, a fire station in the port anymore. And um, just looking at at uh, the probably the most spe spectacular oil train explosion that happened this summer in Lac Megantic in Quebec. Um, there was uh, hundreds of thousands of gallons of burning oil spilling down the street and going down into the manhole covers and running through the sewers, the sewers right towards the buildings. And the, uh, the fire department really couldn't do anything but just try, try what they could do to block the oil and then let it burn out. There, it was, the fires were so big that they, there was just no way they could even really attempt to, to fight them. Um, and one thing that you mentioned in your resolution was something about uh, uh, workers being their, their fellow workers' uh, keepers. And uh, we really come here today as our brothers and sisters' keepers, um, our fellow workers, port workers. And um, uh, interestingly enough, the president of the ILWU down in Vancouver, Washington, came out publicly opposed to an oil terminal that was that's planned to be built in, in Vancouver. He said 
you know, we, we do want the jobs, but it's just not worth the risk. Um, so uh, we're, uh, we're opposed to any future plans for oil, more oil facilities or uh, any kind of liquid fossil fuels going on in our port. Um, we're, we're not against jobs. We want uh, we, we want uh, people to have jobs. There should be full employment. And uh, people that, uh, that need to get retrained for, for jobs that aren't uh, dangerous and harmful for the environment should get retrained. And there should be uh, green jobs in our port. That's what uh, we, we would like our leadership to, uh, to, to fight for on the behalf of the, the whole community is to, uh, to fight for and push for green jobs, things like for example, um, a recycling plant in our port or uh, gr some green manufacturing, something that helps us transform our infrastructure off of the, the harmful and dangerous uh, fossil fuels that we're so dependent on right now but need to, to start moving away from that as soon as possible because of climate change and, uh, and the pollution and the, the, uh, the dangers from the, the transport of fossil fuels that's getting worse and worse, um, and, and the spills, uh, not just the explosions, uh, uh, the diesel em emissions from the trains. Um, but anyway, uh, I know that's uh, not, uh, not specific to the, to the resolution, but um, we think that here's an opportunity for preventative action instead of corrective action, um, would be to, to not allow any more uh, liquid bulk uh, fossil fuels or crude oil facilities in our port instead of correcting it after, after there's some kind of an incident. Um, and uh, let's you. see. Thank you. Thank you very much for your comments. Uh, does anyone else have any comments to make um, in regards to this topic on our safety resolution? Yeah. Thank you. Hi, my name is Carlo Voli, and uh, my question is, is there a plan for a very quick evacuation of everyone within a five-mile radius from an incident in the port? In the tight flats, we do have evacuation plans and routes. Um, each company, keep in mind that the, the, the tidal flats are individual terminal operators as well. Each company has a site-specific safety and response plan. That is required by law. And so evacuation routes for workers within the tidal flats, they have those. The port also has uh, those documents for their employees, which when I say in-house, that reflects the Port of Tacoma employees and then terminal operators have their own separate ones. Uh, the reason I mention this is because of the, um, pla the current presence of back-end oil, back-end crude oil that's coming to the refinery here and plans for a new oil terminal. And back in December, the explosion that happened in Castleton, uh, North Dakota on a train with this uh, back-end crude oil, there was a required uh, five-mile evacuation of all the population around there because of the toxic fumes. Right. Um, this particular type of oil, we're not, you know, I'm not talking about any fossil fuel, we're talking about back end fill oil. Mm -hmm. It's flammable at 73 degrees. Uh, it's been shown to contain 30 to 40 percent volatile gases like benzene and hexane, which are a lot more explosive. And the Federal Pipeline uh, Hazardous Material Safety Administration uh, just declared a few weeks ago that this type of oil is way more flammable and explosive than conventional oil. So I think in any uh, safety plan that you work on, you gotta take into account this situation. I mean, it'd be ideal if no oil, new oil terminal were approved, but we currently already have this oil coming to the Port of Tacoma. So th this is a very serious issue and it needs to be taken into account. Thank, Thank you. you very much. Are there any other comments in regards to the safety plan? Uh, I, I know you have the, 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 the This is the safety resolution, so I'm just. This is for our yes. employees. And for our employees, this is directed specifically. Okay, thank you. Go ahead. Go ahead then. I, 
I just heard on the radio coming here that um, the Canadian and the United States Rail Safety Commissions, I think that's who it was, has just come out with a resolution saying that these back in oil and the other oil trains should not be passing through populated areas. Uh, are you aware of this? Okay. And no, but that doesn't specifically relate to the safety resolution for our port staff right now. But okay, I, at, well, it seems like later, compliance with that. Would, yeah. Madam President, okay. could Thank people you. identify who they are when yes. they come up I'm to the podium? Sorry. My name is Diane Schmidtke, and I'm a, a native of Tacoma. Thank, Thank, you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks. My name is Maureen Howard, and I'm a resident of Tacoma. I have a background in residential construction and professional development and safety, and it was really good. If you dealt with this while I was out of the room, my apologies, but um, you spoke about the need to present training in different formats for people. It's just, so do, do the formats include, in addition to whatever languages obviously are required, but also, um, like, uh, I see a lot of things that are YouTube that obviously were not part of my world, but are a part of everybody's world who's like 40 and below. So do you have sort of parallel um, system, delivery systems, so that in addition to sitting down at a computer and reading something, some, I'm thinking of like the Saul Khan Academy, which I think has a really good model of those function-specific short videos that seem to meet, like I see somebody younger than me. Absolutely. Uh, just to address that, we use a multimedia approach. You, um, again, didactic and lecture training will accomplish a certain uh, port uh, amount of uh, ne necessitated safety training. It always has to be augmented with other training as well. And we do hands-on. We use uh, multimedia, YouTubes, as well as computer-based training. And I'm a strong advocate of that. I've been a... Uh, a fire academy instructor, so same sort of thing. Great, thank you very much. Um, I think, oh, thank you. Hi, I'm Donna Rivera, I'm a local of Tacoma, Washington. Are you guys looking to reduce the number of injuries and are these workers insured um, for on-the-job injuries? Oh. Yes, that's the, uh, that's the approach for a proactive safety program, and uh, the Port of Tacoma is uh, self-insured through a third-party administrator. Thank you very much. I, I, I really want to thank you so much for the presentation. Certainly, it's definitely time to update this resolution. One of the things that I heard also from uh, Commissioner Bacon and others is questions about the emergency planning at the port. So I'm... I'm I would love to see an, uh, another presentation in the future on kind of the general port emergency plans as well. Absolutely. That would be really helpful. We I can think. make that happen. In fact, okay, thank I, you. I'd like to follow yes. that. I, I think we ought to separate the two because when it comes to employees, it's, it's, it's our recordable incident rate and our, and our uh, getting people hurt and the disaster plan that's, that's, that's a little more global and because that, that has an impact, but we ought to talk about that separately. We have a more intense program for, to, re, to reduce the injuries. All right. Thank All right. you very much. And we've had comments, and we have a motion on the table, and I'd like to ask my fellow commissioners to vote on the motion to pass resolution 2014-01. Those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Thank you. The motion is carried. And thank you very, very much. Well, thank you again. Thank you for your time. All right. Thank you. Now I'd like to ask Thais Howard, Director of Engineering, to please come forward. We have some work that's been going on with Tacoma Power, and we'd like to hear from you. Good afternoon. Um, so I am here today for authorization for a local agreement with Tacoma Power for the Administration of Engineering Procurement and Construction Task Orders. And I would like to just note that Joe Rimpey, an employee with Tacoma Power, is here with us today who was instrumental in uh, working on this agreement. So this is um, contract number 069305 for work associated with the Administration of Engineering, Procurement, and Construction Task Orders. So just a little background, in 2008, 
the Port of Tacoma and Tacoma Power began um, discussions about an agreement that would allow us to be able to set the terms, um, to negotiate the terms on how we would do business together when our, the port's development impacts their electrical and power infrastructure. And this agreement sets forth those terms and conditions for the engineering, procurement, and construction task orders. This agreement was entered to, into on April 1st of 2011. The agreement defines a process for defining the scope, schedule, and budget through a task order system. The agreement doesn't auth authorize any uh, funds. When we go through the task order procedure and as part of the development work, that's when the authorization of funds would occur. So without this agreement, the port and um, Tacoma Power would need to negotiate a separate agreement for each development project, which adds significant time to the process. Um, and I just wanted to note some of the recent projects where we have been using this agreement it includes um, when we remove the shoe fly at the LAX property, um, the work going on um, at Terminal 3, 4, and 7, Parcel 14 mitigation, the North Lead Rail extension, as well as Pier 4. So in May 2013, the Commission adopted a new master policy that outlines how the Commission is to approve all interlocal agreements and that that is the type of agreement that the port shall be entering into with other public agencies. So this agreement was executed prior to that new master policy, but staff today were requesting commission to accept the authorization of that executed agreement and so that we can continue to use it. The current agreement expires December 31st, 2015, and prior to that expiration in 2015, we'll begin negotiations and bring that agreement back before you for another um, adoption. So the general terms, as I mentioned, is kind of administration um, and the conditions for the task orders, um, how we're going to re assign resources for the work. We talk about the development, the scope, schedule, and cost, um, the task order um, invoice and payment requirements, and then the definition and requirements for delay damages, along with um, how we go about changing task orders, um, the requirements and responsibilities for permits and site access, dispute resolution, termination, warranty, indemnification, and insurance requirements. Okay. So with that, I request authorization for the acceptance and use of the previously executed agreement with Tacoma Power, contract number 069305, for work associated with the administration of engineering, procurement, and construction task force. Thank you very much. Do I have a motion from the commission? So moved. Second. Um, thank you. Now, questions and comments, please. Um, Commissioner Bacon? Yeah. Um, Thais, tell me, um, is the purpose of this to have kind of an overall agreement uh, in terms of, of assigning responsibilities and costs broadly rather than having to go into it every time? Yes, that's exactly. So it just sets the terms and then whenever we have a project, when we have a specific project, then we go into the details of that task on what that scope, that schedule, and that budget Right. Is. So is there anything in this, uh, in this document or what agreement that speaks to percentages of responsibility or cost? No. So, so generally it depends on what the impact is and what we're asking them to do. But generally if our development is impacting their infrastructure, a lot of that times the cost of that um, falls on us for, as part of the development work. And what we're negotiating with them is what that cost will be. So in other words, we pay the full cost of anything, any of that? Uh, if we impact their, if our development project. impacts their existing infrastructure or requires new infrastructure, generally, yes. Um, my question pertains to item 18, a little bit on what Commissioner Bacon was talking about in terms of cost. But the way I read this is that it talks about these specific task orders. And let's say you, you signed off on a million-dollar task order, according to this, um, they wouldn't have to notify you uh, unless it exceeded 70% of that cost, meaning it could go to 1.7 million? No, no, that's 70% of the not to exceed. So the way that we have it set, because they're invoicing okay, as well, so, so, so before, when they get to 70% of the not, we determine a not to exceed total, 
And then let's say the, it's a million dollars. Right. And so okay. when we get to 700000 they're going to say, Port of Tacoma, we wanted to give you a stop. This is where we are. Let's talk about where we need to go. And what, we put that in there so that we don't exceed the not to exceed cost and then have those discussions. Okay. So it's a stop point, a checkpoint to say, where are we? What do we have left? Let's make sure we're on target to not exceed the not take. So, costs. so the fact is, is almost three fourths of the project would be done before they're obligated yes. to tell you. That well, they're not obligated. We're still receiving monthly invoices. It's just a stop checkpoint. We still receive monthly invoices, and the project manager should be fully aware of where we are on the project. M my concern is, is, is that having that advance notification mm -hmm. is very, very important, yes. and particularly in the case of utilities. My experience has been, wow, sometimes I'm always amazed at what mm -hmm. happens to you in the process. And you really have no choice. There's no alternative. And all, I, all I'm saying is, is that uh, how did the 70% come about rather um, than 50%? I, right. So I will be honest. Um, I can't remember exactly how we negotiated on 70%. We started these negotiations, you know, 2008. Um, but I think there's something that we can look at again when we go into negotiations next year. Well, how has it worked out? Oh, it's easier? worked out fine. So on the projects um, to date, we have not exceeded that not to exceed cost. We're receiving Tommy so invoices. So your experience has been good? Absolutely. Yeah. Okay. Yes. I'm glad to yes. hear that. Yes. Uh, it just okay. seems that yes. That seems to be late in the process, that's all. But but if it's been working okay, I'm, I'm yes. pleased to hear And that. I think it's because we are getting monthly invoices. We're not we, it's not like we're going down a path and have no idea of where okay. we are. You're working Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, yes, Commissioner yeah. uh, I'm not, I don't mean to be totally ignorant about this, but I'm not just sure what this resolution does. Does it require you to talk together? Does it set any kind of uh, responsibilities? I, I'm not sure what it does. Right. So with the agreement, so any time that we um, would previously before the agreement, if we wanted to do work that was going to add infrastructure uh -huh. um, to Tacoma Power System or change or remove it or that uh -huh. sort of thing, we would sit down and negotiate with them how much things were going to cost, what they were going to do, what we were going to do. And this usually happened in the middle of the development when we needed to be moving, not uh -huh. negotiating. Uh -huh. So what we've done is we've negotiated some of those terms that usually get mixed up and going back and forth between the organizations, uh -huh. we've negotiated a lot of those. So the negotiation now only goes to what is the work, how much is it going to cost, and when are we going to be able to get it. The other thing is Tacoma Power's previous policy was that a lot of times you paid up front. If it was going to cost $6 million, you wrote a $6 million check. This agreement allows us to, for them to invoice us. You do the work, we invoice you. So those are some of the benefits. It helps the work get completed in a timely manner uh -huh. outside of the actual development. So in the actual resolution, which we're not seeing here, it says in a, in a project that the port has that impacts the uh, city's utility stuff, that the city will do this, this, and this, and the port will do this, this, and this, and it is specific. Is that what you're telling me? Um, so it depends on what you mean by the this, this, and this, but generally, yes. But depending on the work, that's when we will go into the more details on based on what the work is. We will go into the details on what part of the scope they would do and what part right. we would do. And have you found that in the negotiation of the what you call details, mm -hmm. that it has saved time? And Absolutely. It, and it, yes. And what time doing what? So usually when we determine that we are impacting their infrastructure, we're uh -huh. in the middle of our design. Uh -huh. And so we now we can bring them in. We can show them our design, where we are today. You're only talking about the work, uh -huh. not the warranty, the identification, right, right. and, and all of those other things that have to be included in any agreement. You know, all of that stuff is off of the table, and the only thing you're dealing with is that task, that particular scope of work, which cuts down on the time. To get an agreement, in a task order in place, we get authorization through the project and they can move forward. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Any other questions or comments? No. no. Very good. Thank you. Um, are there any comments from the public on this resolution that's about being discussed? Would you like to make a comment? Um, Joseph Rempe principal engineer, Tacoma Power, Projects and Services. Thank you. Uh, I'd like to reiterate that uh, the relationship between the port, project management staff, and the Tacoma Power Transmission Distribution Engineering section has really been enhanced with the use of this agreement. We're able to now break up the work 
came to pre-engineering, engineering, and procurement and construction sections and control costs that way. I think one of the things that you were concerned with there, Commissioner Meyer, was that in the past, as you do recall, uh, there have been instances where costs exceeded estimates. Yeah. I think um, with this approach that the Port and Power have taken, we have been able to control those costs by the steps that we've taken. In the past, we would come up with a big number. To be honest with you, it was a back of the envelope number. That's why we were having problems with the estimates. Now we're able to get a much more detailed, much more concise number as we go through the process, and we've been able to control costs, whether it's with the Lincoln Avenue project or with any of the other projects. Um, and so it, we view it as a, a big success. Um, one thing what we have done is cut some of the work of the attorneys out. Um, That's good. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Which is every time, is, I think that's us. what Thais was alluding to, is every time we would enter into an agreement, an attorney would have to look at the agreement on both sides. Uh, I, I hope they don't feel bad about that, but we feel very good about that. Okay. It's okay, Carolyn. Don't worry. <laughs> no, thank you. Thank you very much, and thank you for being here today. So, so uh, uh, is there any other further comments, questions? No, then at this moment, we have a request for the authorization of the acceptance of the Tacoma Power and Port of Tacoma ILA. Those in favor, please indicate by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Motions carried. Thank you very, very much for your presentation and participation and collaboration with Tacoma Power and the Port. All right, that moves us into our general business section. And uh, first on the agenda here is the analysis report. Julie Collins, if you could come forward and introduce our visitor. Very glad to have this report today. Absolutely. Well, thank you, commissioners. And at a recent meeting, you had heard about this report that's now out and wanted to have an update today. So we're really excited to share this with you. Just by um, way of reminder, this is an economic development analysis that was done this past summer, reported in November. So it's just new data that was um, conducted on behalf of the Seattle Economic Development Board, the Puget Sound Regional Council, and King County Workforce Central. And though those are um, primarily King County organizations, they recognized that there's a story to tell about the statewide impacts of maritime. And as you'll see in this study, it goes beyond ports. So we're very much a part of this study. The Port of Tacoma was a cooperative partner in providing information for it. Um, and the study encompasses a much broader scope of maritime activities as well. So I think you'll find that really interesting. I think it's also a really um, helpful and timely backdrop for the work that the Port of Tacoma and the Port of Seattle are doing this year in 2014 when we'll be doing an economic development study um, both separately and also in part together for those shared types of businesses that both ports have. And that study will go much deeper. So you'll see a very, um, a very good overview here of some of the port's impacts. I think we'll see a deeper level of analysis in our coming study. So I just wanted to give you that as part of the background as well. One thing that I think is really valuable about this study, again, though, is the timeliness and getting the visibility out to broader audiences about the importance of this maritime sector in our state. And I really want to compliment Community Attributes, the firm that did this work, in really being out on the speaking circuit. They've been at a number of presentations before the media, and I think they've been doing a great job of really helping to amplify the important results that this study has. So I'd like to now introduce Spencer Cohen. And Spencer was a lead um, pr principal on this study. He is the senior economic analyst at Community Attributes. He's been in that position for about a year. And before that, he worked in a couple different capacities for the state of Washington as a senior policy advisor for the Washington Economic Development Commission and also as a research manager for the Washington State Department of Commerce. And he is, um, he's highly credentialed, has a perfect background for this type of work, 
with a BA of, in Mathematics and History, a Master's in China Studies, and he's currently working on his, um, completing his PhD in Economic Geography from the University of Washington. So I'd like to introduce Spencer and look forward to um, a discussion as you uh, hear, these, hear these presentations and he's happy to answer your questions throughout. Thank you. Great. Thank you very much, Julie. Uh, I would yes. just like to welcome Spencer in particular. We work together in the Economic Development Commission at the state level and Spencer did some wonderful work for us. I'm very, very glad to see you again, Spencer. Thank you. It's wonderful to see you, Commissioner Good. Bacon. Good. Great. Welcome. Okay. So uh, first, thank you to, uh, to the Commission for the opportunity to speak today about the work that we've done on the maritime industry in Washington State. Uh, to get started, uh, so whenever our firm does cluster studies, we first like to think about the historic context that gave rise to any given cluster. So in our report, uh, we look at the historic timeline for the maritime industry in Washington State and how it's evolved over time as well. Uh, going early back to the 19th century, uh, particularly with the uh, uh, early developments in naval technology, the naval shipyards uh, being founded uh, in the Puget Naval Shipyards in the 19th century, all the way through a lot of the great exciting work that's gone on of recent and major events and inflection points such as Vigor's uh, acquisition of Todd Shipyards more recently. So. We, um, I'm going to focus today uh, on the measures and impacts aspect um, just for uh, uh, due to time constraints. We did two separate studies that were kind of combined together. So we did an economic impact study and then we did a workforce uh, town pipeline study or workforce development pipeline study for the Workforce Development Council for Seattle King County that was specific to King County where we looked at uh, production of new town and human capital in maritime specific occupations. Um, I won't talk about that today, but I'm happy to distribute that report as well. It's included, actually, in the full report. Um, let's talk about that. So first, uh, when we, uh, we quickly discovered that maritime is not a simple cluster. Um, it's quite complicated. It has lots of different moving pieces and components. And so we wrestled a bit about how to really define the maritime cluster for, and, and before we can even quantify it and come up with estimates for its impact across the state. So this is a bit of an eye chart. It's easier to read when, it's in, when you're reading the report. But we organized uh, the data that we collected into generally five large buckets of activities. Uh, those would be uh, the ship and boat building maintenance repair operations, which includes both the uh, commercial manufacturing of boats and maintenance of boats and repair of boats. Uh, a smaller component is the recreational aspect of maritime, so a lot of the yachts and so forth that are uh, being manufactured. And also, uh, which is actually quite large, is the military component. Um, about half the jobs in this bucket of activities that we looked at in the maritime sector are actually over at the Puget Sound Naval Shipyards. Um, so a lot of stuff going on, a lot of employment, uh, Department of Defense, uh, civilian personnel, a lot of contractors that do work related to the uh, Puget Naval Shipyards. Um, so we captured that as well in our study. Uh, we looked at the maritime logistics and shipping was another component, which we looked at both container and break bulk, as well as tug and barge activities. So this includes in our employment aggregations, things such as uh, uh, terminal operations, freight forwarders, um, even things like uh, uh, river barging activities and refrigeration across the state. Uh, we also looked at passenger water transportation, which includes in our study both the, for instance, the ferry system, but also uh, cruise ships and other related recreational cruise activities. And fishing and seafood processing, which uh, we included both the fishing industry, but also canning and lots of other food processing related uh, issue, uh, industries that are tied in supply chain with uh, the Alaskan fisheries, for instance. And lastly, uh, we wanted to capture a lot of other activities we thought were relevant to maritime and did maritime work, but did not fit neatly within the employment data as it's organized. So for the first four, we relied heavily on North American Industry Classification System codes, which is the standard code, the way that data is being is organized in federal data on employment. Uh, but the last category, uh, we wanted to capture a lot of other stuff that's relevant. So for instance, this would include things like naval architects, um, uh, law firms, and so forth. So we captured a lot of that as well in our maritime uh, support services. And I encourage you also, uh, as I go through this presentation, feel free to interrupt me at any point. So, 
Could I ask uh, a question? I'm sorry, it's on that previous slide. Oh, sure. Uh, where you, in your little footnote, it says size of box sh uh, shapes corresponds to industry employment. Mm -hmm. Is that, you know, um, like, um, I'm assuming one job in the maritime logistics corresponds to one job in fishing and sea or seafood process. So you just use the actual number of positions rather yeah. than, because if you looked at value of those payrolls, mm -hmm. uh, I suspect you would get uh, uh, maybe a different kind of a box. Mm -hmm. Because one of the things that I think is very, very important uh, th that I typically, when I think about an uh, uh, industry cluster is, is one, what's the value of those jobs? Two, what's the investment that they are making? Because a lot of people don't perhaps understand what the real source of tax revenues are. Mm -hmm. And that's important, I think, when I look when I look at economic development. I think that's very, very important. I, I completely agree. And in, in our study, this is a very high overview of our study, but in our study we actually look at the, uh, the wages, wages and benefits by component of the cluster. And I'll talk a little bit later about the, uh, the economic impact and the interesting thing is that, particularly with maritime, it's the it's because the wages across many of these activities are so high, the broader impact across the economy is through the high wages yes. um, that play a really critical role. Thank you, Mr. Christian. So, um, based on these aggregations of employment, uh, in 2012, we estimate there are just shy of 58,000 jobs in the maritime industry. These includes the five activities I just brief, uh, brief previously mentioned, plus the self-employed, which are predominantly in the fishing industry. So there's a lot of uh, fishermen that work as sole proprietors that are included as well. I think the thing to note is that despite the significant decline in employment overall in the state economy, both total employment and non-farm employment uh, during the recession, maritime is actually quite resilient. And I think the big reason for that is because a lot of the maritime activities are export-oriented, they're, tra they're tradable activities. And we saw that through the recession, we saw that a lot of Washington State activities in the economy that were tradable were much more resilient and a little bit less, a little more shielded from the decline in domestic demand within the U.S. Uh, in terms of establishments, so establishments is sort of a data wonk term. It's the way that data is reported to us through the Bureau of Labor Statistics. It essentially means a site. So uh, many, one company in Washington State can have many different establishments across the state. We still think it's a useful term. Uh, to kind of understand the, the number of locations across the state where maritime activities are going on. So in 2012, again, we had about 2,100 establishments or places where maritime workers were employed based on our definition. The, one of the reasons why the, there was less of a decline than employment was, we think, because of some consolidation. So some companies consolidated some of their establishments. Um, so we didn't see as much of a decline. In terms of gross business income, this is uh, our measure of output. So essentially it's gross receipts, so revenues generated by maritime related industries. In this case, it's for the private sector. The thing to notice, I believe, I think, is that uh, from 2008 to 2009, there was a significant decline, about 15% in gross business income among maritime activities in Washington State. That compares, however, with only 4% decline in employment. So what that tells us, when we look at the, these numbers, what that tells us is that in many cases, uh, maritime companies really valued their workers and decided to retain those workers even though there was a significant decline in business. Um, they had a long view and saw the importance of retaining those workers in the long run. And we can see that since then, um, and I believe this owes largely, or at least in part, to exporting, uh, you see, I see a big increase from 2009 to 2012 to a new high, and this is all adjusted to 2012 dollars, up to $15.2 billion. So the next thing we wanted to do once we've been able to quantify the maritime industry based on our definition is to, we use an input-output approach, uh, which is a model published by Washington State uh, Office of Financial Management, and we have a, we customize that model to try to estimate what's the overall impact to the industry. So when I say impact, we're talking about two things, uh, well actually three things. So there's the direct impact, which are all the direct employees within the maritime industry, which we mentioned before is about 58,000 workers and about uh, $15.2 billion in sales. But there's also what we call indirect effects. So that's when maritime businesses create jobs or additional jobs are created through vendors, through suppliers, through other activities that directly sell goods and services to the maritime industry in Washington State, maritime companies. 
And lastly, there's the, what we call the induced impact. And that's when all these new workers that are hired throughout the state and are paid wages then spend that new income, that new, in, that new personal income that's been earned through these jobs throughout the economy on anything. Could be coffee, could be cars, whatever it might be. And that creates addis additional jobs, revenues, <coughs> and wages. And so the interesting thing, as I mentioned before, is that the maritime industry pays much higher on average, aggregating all of the, the sectors that we look at, um, than the state median wage. And so the impact is really much more in terms of the induced or income effect. Uh, because they pay really high wages, those wages are spent throughout the economy and create additional employment throughout the economy. We estimate that overall, when you factor in all these different effects, uh, the maritime industry is responsible either indirectly or directly, indirectly, or through additional incremental effects for about 148,000 jobs in 2012. We also estimate that uh, the maritime industry, through both its direct tax payments as well as taxes paid by other activities that are supported by the maritime industry, collectively supported $352 million in state taxes in 2012. Real quick, with regard to the indirect jobs, were you able to uh, look at each individual sector <clears throat> and try to determine how many indirect jobs were affected by that sector? Mm -hmm. Yeah, we can so. do that. Um, we didn't publish that in the report, but we can certainly do that. Yeah, um, I, I guess I just look at it and see a person in the shipbuilding industry, for example, uh, how many jobs does that person uh, indirectly affect compared to someone working on the waterfront, on the docks, loading and unloading ships, where commodities have to be brought in by different aspects? Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. And we, if, we can, if, I could, if you do have that information, I'd be really interested to see it. Okay. I'm happy to, I'm happy to do that. You. I'm now just going to touch briefly on um, some mapping that we did to try to assess the distribution geographically. So um, this was a Washington State uh, analysis, so we looked broadly across the entire state. But we also used some uh, private, uh, privately published data uh, by Hoover's, which is a publisher of, of business directory data, to try to match our definition of maritime with locations of maritime activities across the state. So you can see, probably no surprise, that there's a uh, very large concentrations in Seattle and Tacoma, um, owing to the port system and other related activities in those areas. Um, there's also a large concentration of activities up in Everett and Marysville, and also in Bremerton, owing to the Puget, Puget Sound Naval Shipyard. So, excuse me, Spencer, did I hear you say earlier on that uh, this was based on private industry? Does that then not include the port's effect? Oh, no, this, this is the, the data is, is, is a private sector, it's published by a private company, but this is uh, both public and private. Oh, okay, thank you. And then we worked with Employment Security Department to look at, based on our definition of maritime, what is the distribution of jobs by county across the state? And again, perhaps no surprise, we see high concentrations of maritime activities where there's water. So, <laughs> what is surprise, surprise. That was the lowest common denominator definition for us. <laughs> so it's got to be near water. But actually, surprisingly, uh, perhaps not surprisingly, but there's a, uh, based on our definition, we actually found a lot of interesting maritime activity away from water in a lot of ways. So, mm -hmm. or at least away from the coast. Um, a lot of shipping related activities, refrigeration activities, um, which really ties in with the importance of the port and the extent to which the interior part of the state heavily depends upon the port for the shipping of its, uh, you know, of its commodities abroad. Um, there's also some boat building activity that's inland uh, around Lake Chelan. There's a large concentration of private, uh, of recreational boats, boat manufacturing. So I'm probably going to stop there um, for the uh, interest of time. But as I mentioned, we did a workforce assessment as well. And I'm happy to distribute that and share that with the commissioners uh, and discuss that further. So. Yeah. Please go ahead. Uh, I, I really like your report. I, I'd like to have the whole thing so you can just take more time to really take a look at it. Mm -hmm. uh, my, my question, if we take a look at the maritime, how does that compare to other major industries within the state? So mm -hmm. if there's X number of jobs in the state, how much does maritime account for that? Is it 50% or 10% or 1%? Mm -hmm. uh, and so how does it compare to, say, Microsoft or Boeing or aerospace or, or, aerospace or the, software, the software industry? Mm -hmm. That's a great question. So. Um, we actually, so our firm actually did a study on Boeing specifically, on Boeing production lines in Washington State as well, in aerospace overall this, uh, in the fall. And that gave us some perspective on the differences between maritime versus aerospace. 
Um, aerospace is larger. I mean, aerospace yes, employs sure. directly 94,000 workers versus 58,000. Um, but in terms of their multiplier effect, which is the for every one job in the maritime industry, how many jobs overall are supported either directly or indirectly through the maritime industry? And the number was about two and a half there, if I remember. Yeah, yeah, yeah it's actually quite similar. Yeah. And I think it's similar, I believe it's similar because both industries pay really good wages. Yeah. And it's really that wage effect. I mean, one thing we discovered when we did this, because we interviewed a lot of stakeholders. We had, we had uh, 25 stakeholders as part of this, uh, our steering committee, and also we went out and did a lot of interviews with uh, with manufacturers, um, companies like Quijack in Seattle, boat manufacturer, uh, fishing companies, food processors. The thing we discovered is that, especially for instance with boat building, is that there isn't really much of a supply chain in Washington. There's a lot of boat builders, but um, compared to other industries, the supply chain is more, uh, it's more outside of the state. Um, it's really the wholesalers. So the effect is really through the high wages that are really driving that impact. I've always and I, I think that's uh, that's true, and I think one of the things about high wages is, yeah, I always argue discretionary income. Mm -hmm. And so discretionary income is a function of your wages plus your benefit package. Mm -hmm. And over the next several years, as the benefit package changes for something, we might get some significant shifts in this because as we transfer more costs onto somebody else, then they don't. Have, the, then the discretionary income goes down, and, and it has has, has a, a negative impact. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Excuse me. Yes. Yeah. Uh, when we go out and talk about the ports, we say, and not just port people, but the governor and others say, that one job in four um, is um, is created by activity, business activity at the ports. Is that the way to say trade. it? Trade. 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 Related. Trade. Is that correct, or, or does trade make it much broader? And what would be the that number if you were just considering the maritime industry? Hmm. I don't, well, our firm did a study a couple years ago for the Washington Council of International Trade that estimated about 40% of jobs are some way tied to trade, either directly or indirectly. Right. I'm not sure specifically about uh, the impact of the port, but that can certainly be calculated. If you but I'm not that, sure yeah, about and, uh, Right. We don't want to be out there saying something that isn't so. So for me, I have to remember to associate it with trade, not just the maritime industry. Right, right exactly. Yeah. But one could calculate, for instance, for every container that passes through the port of Tacoma or port of Seattle or, or in the state in general, um, based on the value and based on the, the value added created through workers and stevedoring related to that, um, what's the over, what's the what's the broader impact of that, and why is it important for the state? Yeah. So, yeah, thank you. Uh, quick question that, that I have, and that is, is that when you look at the was it thirty billion in sales, or mm -hmm. there was some number there? Um, how does that relate to the state's GDP? Is there? Mm -hmm. I mean, because it, it gets a little bit, I think, uh, in the questions you were alluding to, Commissioner Johnson, Marzano, in terms of <laughs> understanding the maritime cluster relative to the overall. Yeah, it, yeah. Like yeah. And, and, yeah. and so, it, do we represent five percent, ten percent, twenty percent? Well, the, it's a, that's a great question. I think that the so the state GDP is about three hundred and seventy billion dollars. Mm -hmm. um, the merit, but the number there for sales is not net of cost, so it's not a value added statement. Um, I would guess, and I, I haven't done the calculation, so you it's not you can't compare that the gross business income to G, GDP uh, and draw come up with a ratio of percentage. Um, but I would guess uh, there are ways to do that though. Um, we have not done that, but there are ways to do it. I would guess it's probably something around two to three percent, maybe higher. Um, I think aerospace. Uh, I think aerospace is probably around five percent, six percent directly. But um, I'd have to go back and check. We could find. We could try to find that out, though. I, I really, is particularly if you're going to provide additional information to Commissioner Mazzano and the entire commission, I'd like to see that, just in the context of what that estimate is. Mm -hmm. I, and I agree with that because what that does that helps. Yeah, as we look towards trying to find a, traffic, a transportation package, uh, even the state's a business. Yeah. So I'm going to invest my money in the most profitable thing for my state. Mm -hmm. And it, it helps us show that the transportation package is, is really key for the state. And, and, and not only that, but also some of us believe that if you invest in infrastructure, it will actually generate mm -hmm. revenue to pay for education. Yeah. There is, seems return. to be a nexus there in my mind. Yeah. And, and we estimate that the maritime industry is responsible in some way for more than a thir third of a billion dollars in state fiscal revenues. Okay. Um, and that's just mm -hmm. state revenues. So that's not – Wow. That, that doesn't include um, – you know, that, w that would not include things like, you know, local revenues, local tax revenues. Mm -hmm. But we estimate based on direct payments by the maritime industry – plus all of the additional uh, taxes generated through uh, activities supported by Maritime, 
that about $352 million in 2012 dollars uh, were paid out to the state. And you're saying so. we can have a copy of your, of your report? Mm -hmm. Great. Yeah, if I, I'll, um, I, I'll work with the jewel afterwards, and we'll distribute the copy. Um, I'm happy to do that. That's great. I do wow. have a question about the workforce assessment. Yeah. I believe that you said that it was limited to the workforce assessment in King County. Mm -hmm. Um, is there any discussion about uh, expanding that to Pierce County as well in the future, hmm. or doing a study down here? I, I don't know for sure. Um, I, I don't. I'm not. I'm not aware of any conversations about that. But um, uh, we have a model that we we have a, a we've developed a transparent approach um, mm -hmm. to estimating what that pipeline is for talent related to a given industry based on a crosswalk of occupations and so, okay. uh, yeah. Can you just describe the, the assessment part of the, of the project? I don't care where it's at. Let's say we, we take King County. So what, what's included in a workforce assessment? Oh, sure. So we look at, um, we rely on a couple sources. So uh, the Employment Security Department publishes an occupational uh, industry-based forecast. So they say basically based on attrition, based on uh, demand for workers, this is what, this is what the, the, the occupational count is going to be per occupation uh, for a given industry. These are where the opportunities are, essentially. That's where the opportunities are. And then we match that with a workforce pipeline. So we look at, well, who are all the people that are currently employed in those occupations? And then who are the, uh, we look at the, institu the educational institutions and apprenticeship programs, and we say, well, how many people are being produced out of those apprenticeship programs that are relevant to those, in, those occupations and those industries? So, for instance, how many welders are, are in apprenticeship programs? Um, and we try to project out what, if this stays in this, this path, then what is that going to indicate in terms of the number of new workers that can join the workforce in that field? We also look at UI claims, and we match UI claims with, uh, we rely on a forecast of unemployment insurance, and we draw a correlation between UI claims and um, uh, projected or forecast unemployment to try to arrive at what are the additional UI claims in those given occupations. That's very valuable for the young people coming up because I've always found the best way to get a, a higher paying job is to find the short line, mm -hmm. um, yeah, exactly. <laughs> not the long line. Right. Exactly. Has, has the state done that as a whole? Uh, it's, I, so we've done this a couple times simp just for not just maritime but also for, uh, for health care. Uh, we've done it for health care and then we've we, um, We've been exploring some other industries, too, that we could do it with. We've only partnered right now with uh, uh, Seattle King County uh, uh, Workforce Development Council. Because my impression is there's some huge holes coming forward. Oh, yeah, yeah. And there's and one thing that we learned a lot just by talking with companies is just the graying of the workforce, you know, a lot of the kind of high-skilled workers that they're looking for. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. Great. I've got a couple. <laughs> I have more than two. <laughs> Spencer, thank you very, very much. Thank you. Great nice. report. And I look forward to that, being able to read the details nice. of it and, mm -hmm. and know that uh, you'll be available to answer questions if we have some. Yeah, I'll be available. Um, I'll distribute my email, or, or Julie, can pass, Julie can distribute Great. my email as well. So I'm happy to answer questions. Great. Thank, thank you. you. Thank, thank you very much. much. I appreciate that. Yeah. All right. Thank you, Julie, so much. John Wolf, this is uh, the time for community news, events, and recognitions. Thank you, Commissioner. Um, earlier we had a presentation on uh, port safety, and um, there were some questions around a broader uh, emergency management. And it just so happens that, um, coincidentally, um, we are in partnership with the City of Tacoma Emergency Management. And as you recall, the port secured some grant, federal grants to um, establish a port early warning system. Now this system is in place for things like a natural disaster and that um, certainly if there was a larger incident in the tide flats it could be used as well. And uh, the uh, City of Tacoma Emergency Management is providing four public education seminars for the community members interested in learning more about the uh, port early warning system. And um, seminars will take place at the Greater Tacoma Convention Center uh, on uh, January 22nd, which is already come and gone. <laughs> and, uh, um, Yesterday. Through, uh, oh, and I'm sorry, January 25th. Um, so um, that's just around the corner. And uh, so if you need more information, please reach out to the City of Tacoma. Also, um, wanted to just make mention that uh, as we uh, in the commission staff are out in the community sharing the story about the Port Tacoma. Uh, we have opportunities upon us. Uh, we'll be in front of the World Trade Center on January 24th. That's tomorrow. 
And uh, then again uh, with the Transportation Club on February 10th. Uh, Pierce County Realtors Association on February 21st and the UWT Urban Studies Program on February 12th. So some great opportunity for us to uh, reach out to the community and uh, the industry and share what's going on at the Port of Tacoma and, um, and also hear from the community. And um, I wanted to make mention that we have some guests in the audience, some, some uh, partners of the port. Our D.C. lobbyists are here, and I wanted to invite Sean Egan to uh, come forward and introduce our partners, our D.C. lobbyists that are here with us today. Thank you. Good afternoon, Commissioners. Again, Sean Egan, Government Affairs for the Port. Uh, as you know, for the last 30 years, the Port has been represented in Washington, D.C. by Denny, Denny Miller & Associates. Uh, Denny had served a long, distinguished career representing the port's interests in our nation's capital. Uh, but as time goes on, eventually you decide it's time to hang up the spurs, and that was certainly the case for Denny this last fall. Uh, Denny decided to retire and had shut down his firm. Uh, coming out of that, Wally Burnett and Shay Hancock, two uh, folks there with the firm that we've worked with for a long time, decided to strike out on their own, and they formed a new lobbying firm called Capital Strategies. Uh, joining them were Tim Levine and Chris Miller, and it just so happens those four individuals are the four individuals that we work with most with the Denny Miller firm. So in light of that, uh, John made the decision that we would novate the existing lobbying contract with Denny Miller and Associates over two capital strategies for the remainder of the contract, which is just a few more months. We just figured it made the most sense to have continuity with that contract uh, up until the contract is up, uh, up for renewal later on this summer, at which point in time we would certainly be bringing that to the full commission. Uh, the team happens to be here in the state uh, visiting with clients, and with us today we have Wally, Shay, and Tim, so I wanted to uh, turn the mic over to them in case they wanted to get up and, and say a few words. Thank you, Sean. Thank you, Tim. It's yeah. good to see you. Pleasure to be with you again. Uh, wearing the new hat. I, uh, it's been a play pleasure working with Denny for all those years. I, I think I started with him in August of '84, and right away he got me working on a Port of Tacoma thing, the uh, Coast Guard <laughs> permit, so you could uh, fill in the Milwaukee Waterway and the new Sea Land Terminal that was wow. being constructed at the time. So uh, I think now he's about on the 11th tee at Indian Wells. <laughs> <laughs> my calculations, but uh, yeah, we just want to provide seamless transition. Um, uh, uh, keep doing a good work for most of our most of the professionals from DMA are, are in our capital strategies most of the clients at DMA are with us and uh, we just want to keep uh, keep the services going and maybe find ways to do it even better so we're good. Great. Great. Thank you. It. anything special top of your list that you're working on well, good old harbor maintenance tax you know we uh, yep. uh, we often have talked about that but I as I've said it's it's a long hard slog but we've ne never seen as much movement as we've had recently on that um, both in the Word of Bill that's in conference and in the uh, Maritime Goods Movement Act that the senators have introduced and that will be introduced in the House side soon. And it's given us a great opportunity, I think, for some public education, too, to help. Yeah. Uh, to, uh, yeah. So I think a lot of the policymakers in, in, um, at the federal level are more aware now that not all ports are alike and that some ports don't need dredging and that uh, some ports uh, face serious competition from Canada. The West Coast ports' needs are different from those. Our silt-plagued... Uh, silt uh, uh, brothers in, uh, in the southeast, and uh, it has been a good opportunity, I think, to, to educate uh, policymakers, and hopefully we'll just keep going, uh, keep the momentum going, and actually get some changes. That's the main one. We have other issues, of course, in federal freight policy and right. homeland security, and trade is, is perking back up again, too, uh, this year. Yeah. So I'm happy to answer any questions, or we'll just... Uh, Are you in the same office, in the same building? No, we moved. Uh, we're about four blocks away. Mm -hmm. um, uh, and uh, uh, 455 Massachusetts Avenue Northwest, and uh, uh, but uh, looking forward to the new challenges. Yeah, okay. great. Great. Thank you for coming. Really glad to have you here, and look forward to continuing our work with you. Okay. A little warmer here than back. Uh, yeah. Oh, too yeah. huh? Good timing on coming out here. That's all. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, okay. Thank you very much. Anything further? All right, then it's time for public and commissioner comment. And I believe we have a list of uh, uh, people possibly who signed up for public comment. If so, I wonder if you could bring that forward. And uh, first off, I will ask for public comment. Thank you, Judy. 
Oh, okay. Oh, good. We have ten people who signed up for public comment. So, I'm gonna. I'm gonna. And I, I, does each person wish to speak? Excuse me. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Okay. Then I think what we'll do is we'll, we'll try to limit the time for our public comments to about two, two to two and a half minutes. I'll put my timer on here. Thank you. Thank you very much. My name is Mary Ellen Noop, K-N-O-O-P. I live in Gig Harbor. I'm a member of the Green Party of Pierce County. And um, I used to work at the port. <laughs> um, but as a, an employee of Western Clinic, I was at the clinic for the first aid. That was years ago, though. I respectfully submit the following questions and concerns that I have regarding the transportation of fossil fuels through the highly built up and heavily populated areas surrounding the Port of Tacoma. And by the way, I do thank you so much for allowing time to speak. With regard to the transporting of fossil fuels, which railway lines are considered for that use? What is their route or routes? Which railway beds of the considered railway lines are laid on areas of fill which can liquefy during an earthquake? What is the present state of maintenance on these railroad lines? What emergency measures or plans does the Port Commission envision for dealing with a derailed oil train in the port or perhaps outside the port? Does the Port and the Port Commission anticipate liability for oil spills, explosions and fires, liability from um, being sued by ICE, the city of Tacoma, outlying towns. I would greatly appreciate a, plot, a reply from the commission as a whole or even individual commissioners. I can be reached at 253-851-8615 or at my email mnoop at comcast.net. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you, thank you very much. Thank you for and thank you for your concise questions, sir. All right. Thank you. We'll just take public comments. The next person who had signed up to make public comment was Bill. Bill Need. Uh, Bill Merritt. Merritt. Thank you. Uh, no, I just want to. Uh, follow what uh, Mary Ellen said with a, from a different point of view. <clears throat> Three days ago in the uh, Tacoma uh, Tribune, the TNT, I found this quote in an article. The hottest years on record in the United States all have occurred in the past 15 years. And then the next day in the TNT, I saw this. Quote, more crude oil was spilled in the United States rail incidents last year than was spilled in the nearly four decades since the federal government began collecting data on such spills. Now those are two very, they hit me hard as, a, as an individual uh, because uh, <clears throat> we know that uh, Climate change is a very important issue in our lives, and particularly in the lives of our grandchildren. Um, and as a result, I have, uh, in the last uh, two or three months, spent a lot of time meeting uh, economic historians. And uh, uh, one said that in May 2013, Shell-shocked climate scientists warned that unless we urgently adopt radical measures to suppress greenhouse gas emissions, the acceleration, accelerating GHG concentrations will be beyond any human power to stop runaway warming. Now that scares me as an individual. 
And uh, it may be uh, wrong. I hope it's wrong, <laughs> what they're saying. But uh, there's enough uh, scientists who are saying this. And so I simply want you uh, to take that into consideration as you consider the increasing of trains carrying uh, fossil fuels through the port to be shipped off to some uh, foreign country. Great. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you very, very much. Thank you. Jerry Kuntz. Hi, uh, I'm Jerry Koontz, uh, a 40-year uh, veteran of Tacoma, and I use that term in its true sense, veteran of Tacoma. Um, when I first came to Tacoma back in the early 70s, uh, I'm a sociologist, so I'm really interested in power, who has it and who doesn't. And I did a study of Tacoma when I first arrived, and I am certain other professors at UPS, uh, concluded that of all the organizations in Tacoma, the Port of Tacoma had the most power, far more power than the city council or the various other organizations here. And I still believe that's true. I think all you have to do is look at the building here being held true. Uh, that's not to say, that's not a con condemnation, that's just a statement of fact. But with power comes great responsibility. And I believe you have great responsibility in terms of fossil fuels. Uh, these things are going to kill us. And they're well on their way. And unless we do something about this, we're going to contribute to the suicide of the Earth. Um, and this is disturbing to me, somehow. Um, maybe not for me, but for, as, uh, as Bill said, for my grandchildren. Uh, this is very disturbing. And the problem is in Tacoma, it doesn't have to be that way. I mean, Tacoma, um, the time flats, is a wonderful place for all sorts of activities. Uh, it doesn't have to be devoted to parking oil trains or coal trains or anything like that, Tacoma could be devoted to sustainable energy, for example. You know, there was a study back in the, uh, I think the mid-70s, uh, that were talking about harnessing the tides mm -hmm. of the Narrows. Mm -hmm. I don't know if any of you saw that, mm -hmm. but I found that absolutely intriguing. Uh, they figured that they could use that kind of power to damn near power Tacoma. Mm -hmm. um, now, why would we do stuff like that? I mean, instead of spending all our money on fossil fuels, and I understand why, you know, because of the power of the big oil companies, uh, but um, it makes a lot more sense. Fossil fuels are on the way out anyway, folks. I hate to tell you this, but uh, the price of coal has dropped like 30% in the last 40, uh, 40 months. Uh, it's on the way out. Uh, China has said, we don't want it anymore. It's choking our people. We can't work. You know. Um, you got three minutes. Yeah. Okay. Thank okay. you. Um, so I, 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 I beseech you to take a more critical look at fossil fuels and their role in the poor. You have the power to do something about it. Okay, thank you very thank much. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, all right, the next person is either Dwayne or Diane. I'm not. Uh, I Diane, think it's a Diane. Be, thank you. <laughs> yes. <laughs> thank you very much. Hi, my name is Diane Schmidke, um, <laughs> and I was born and raised in Tacoma, and I remember a Sarco. I remember the damage this plant spewed onto our waterfront in our neighborhoods as I was growing up. And I know how Asarco shifted the cost of cleaning up the catastrophe onto the taxpayers. Millions and millions of taxpayer dollars have already been spent and we are not through trying to clean up. Now Washington State has become the focus of the fossil fuels industry. 
Peabody Coal, BNSF Railway, is proposing shipping coal from Montana along our Columbia River and our gorgeous coast uh, via 18 mile long coal trains per day. Each train car loses 40 pounds of coal on its journey and virtually tons of coal dust will spread into the neighborhoods, farms, estuaries affecting the health of our residents, livestock, etc., and marine habitat. It also degrades the rail beds, increasing the danger for all rail traffic, and then enter oil terminals. Um, there are proposals for increased oil terminals in Washington State which would transport the fuel from the bacon oil uh, formation in North Dakota and the Canadian tar sands. And under these proposals, it's possible that as many as 23 mile long coal trains would be added to the already 55 trains passing through. If both proposals were realized, we could have 96 trains passing through our congested intersections every day. No one in the U.S. can be unaware of the oil trains that recently blew up in Canada and North Dakota and elsewhere in dramatic and terrifying catastrophes. And yet, the increase in oil and coal trains through our region has gone pretty much undetected by the general public. You do know about it, and surely you are con uh, concerned about the congestion that these 41 additional trains could create for our port business, and surely you are concerned for the safety and environmental risks they pose. I'm asking as a taxpayer and a Tacoma native that you act pursuant to your own environmental goals and resist this dangerous train traffic. Don't let the oil, coal, and rail companies reap the profits and shift the costs again of their reckless greed onto the Washington taxpayers, like Asarco did. In addition, I'm asking that you partner with your community by raising awareness about these important developments. If you alert the public and if you give them a forum, they will come and they will object especially those who, like me, remember a circle. Yeah. Thank you very, very much. Um, the next person is Sarah Morgan. Um, I'm also a member of a group called No Coal Trains Through South Sound. Um, I didn't mention that earlier. Um, one thing that Jerry Koontz was saying about how, how much power the, the port holds in our community, um, it, it seems like it would make sense if you had your public meetings at a time that would be more convenient for most working people, like uh, at 6 p.m. Um, noon on a Thursday, it's, it's nearly impossible for, for most people to get here. The, the fact that we got uh, 10 or more people to come and talk about this is uh, like a miracle. Um, I've, uh, I've got a letter that, that I'm going to email to all of the commissioners, but I've got a, a paper copy for, for Claire Petrich today um, uh, just talking about uh, some, some questions that I have um, uh, with regards to any plans that you might have for, uh, for crude oil projects in the port. Um, and I could imagine that... Um, that you might have some uh, some information that that we don't have access to about this that that we would like to have like um, like what the evaluation process um, has been what evaluation process has been done to determine that crude oil would be a good idea in our port and what research documentation individuals and data were included in r arriving at that decision and just uh, a record of any correspondence that's that's gone on with with any parties, uh, with the railway companies, with the uh, with the uh, petroleum companies, um, with the city of Tacoma, with the Pierce County. Um, anyway, I'll I'll give give this letter to Claire, okay, thank and uh, thank you. Okay, thanks very much. Yeah, I know we do televise our meetings, but uh, we've, they've been at different times and. 
different periods of time. Thank you. Thank you for your comment. Um, Robert Whitlock. Hi, uh, my name is Rob Whitlock, and I'm from Olympia, Thurston County, and uh, I, I work in the health industry. I support people with disabilities in their activities of daily living, and uh, I'm also uh, an activist for social and environmental justice. Um, uh, ever since I read a book by Jerry Mander called in the absence of the sacred, uh, the failure of technology and the survival of Indian nations. And I was also influenced by the work of Ralph Nader early on in my understanding of uh, politics and the way the world works. And so um, mostly I'm here because I want to start a conversation um, around the Puget Sound and more broadly about uh, industrialization and about uh, petroleum in particular and its powerful influence over society and economics and also perhaps in terms of politics and where we're at as a society um, looking at a massive extinction of species that has occurred in the last 100 or 150, 200 years since uh, the <coughs> advent of uh, intensive industrialization in the mid 18th century or 19th century 1800s and um, looking at uh, the overall economic activity going beyond the biological carrying capacity of the planet the the petroleum industry is the wealthiest industry on the planet in, in the history of humankind a hundred billion dollars in profits annually um, that's a hundred billion. That's on top of CEO pay rates of sixty million dollars a year. Um, <clears throat> and so, what I what I'm asking about is why is this industry that is behaving in in a way that I think most people would agree is reckless when you when you talk about extinction of species and human rights abuses and and any number of horrible things that have happened. Uh, why, why are they allowed to make so much money or take so much money? Um, and what can we do about it? Um, why don't we have uh, an economy that is sustainable and renewable? Why don't we proceed in a way that is humane? Um, and so, you know, I think we just need to have a broader conversation about this. Uh, the Port of Tacoma can obviously facilitate that process. And uh, I just hope you all will earn, think about this earnestly and um, be open to further talking and conversations. Thank, thank you. you. Yeah, thank you very much. I'm Maureen Howard. Thank you. My name is Maureen Howard, and I'm a resident of Tacoma. I grew up in a port city, Longview, Washington, along the Columbia River, where the industries emitted pollutants that pitted the cars in the parking lots. We'll never know the effect on children um, from that community. I moved to another port city, Tacoma, in 1980, as the era of the Tacoma aroma was ending, thankfully. I represented the U.S. government as a diplomat in a beautiful port city, Cape Town, South Africa, and I saw what happened when the policies of the government serve only the needs of the very few and the very rich and the very powerful. Well, I figure you all work for us, and so here's what I want you to do. I want this port to be a center of commerce and sustainable jobs. I do not want this port to be a center for receiving, transit, storage, processing, or shipping of coal or oil or their byproducts. I want to feel safe in my home and when I come across railroad tracks, when I breathe the air, my community, and I want to be honorable in the world. I ask no coal trains come to this through or to this port, no additional oil trains beyond what comes in today come to or through this port, and that contracts governing these oil trains and the businesses to which they come be reviewed in terms of ending dates and cost of, of ending these contracts. 
I ask that this emergency response plan that we've talked about a couple of different ways today address all potential dangers from coal if they come and the oil trains which are coming at their current level and at their, it sounds like, hopeful level on your part, and that these plans be publicly and easily available to the citizens of this community, that further that they, they be coordinated with all local jurisdictions, with the military, similar emergency response plans, and all other applicable plans. If we are nothing else, we are a planning state. And that, um, yeah, I think that'll do for now. Thank you. Thank Thanks you. for the opportunity for a public comment. Thanks for putting yourselves on TV. Um, I think that helps. And I echo what's been said earlier. I, I don't think people who live here really know either the power of the port or feel like we own it, but we do. So, thanks. Thank you very much. I think we feel that the people of Pierce County own the port very much. So, thank you very much. Um, Martina? Martina Perry? Perry or Carrie? Hello, my name is Martina Campbell. Could you put the microphone down to your mouth, please? Could you put the microphone down? down? Push it down. There you go. My name is Martina Campbell. I'm a tribal member of the Gallup Tribe, and this is a very important issue for my grandchildren and my future. And I totally disagree 100% on any fossil fuel being brought, transported from the Port of Tacoma, as well as coal and oil. So I take it that you will take it into consideration to not have it brought here. Thank you. Thank you very much. And the last person for public comment is Madonna Rivera. My name is Madonna Rivera. I'm a Pilaf tribal member, also a Tacoma native, born and raised here. Um, I wanted to know if we're going to be having these imports of fossil fuel, coal, petroleum, what preventive measures can we take for emergency response to these these um, explosions that are happening on our railways, in our companies, for our workers? Um, and what emergency, emergency responses are available for these workers, for these railroads? Because they go way up into the mountains where there's nobody. I want to know who's, who's going to be safe from this if the emergency firefighters can't get to our workers, if we're going to have emergency prevention committees to prevent um, disasters in our communities, in our towns, in our counties, um, and how are these products being tracked and recorded for companies requesting such things within our towns? Um, and also, how is this going to impact our people? during cleanup, um, repopulating these areas, how's it gonna impact our wildlife, um, and how can we implement these techniques into our communities? Thank you. Great, thank you very, very much. Is there anyone else who has a comment to make today? Well, I, I wanna thank each and every one of you who have come to speak. I. I um, I, I wanted to hear, I think you, you, you bring forward a topic that is incredibly important to all of us as members of the community, and I know we all are anxious to know what you have to say. I do have to say that there is no, no conversation around the Port of Tacoma shipping coal through the port, so if you had that idea, that is not so, and I just wanted you to be assured of that at this time, that's not so. So um, I thank you for your time uh, for coming here to speak with us at the port and uh, look forward to to our being able to answer some of your questions so thank you and at this time I'd like to know if there are any comments from my fellow commissioners before we close our meeting um, Just, uh, two, two quick ones one is I want to thank the uh, propeller club and the ILW local 23 for their last meeting I think it was attended by what I would call a record number uh, it was well received Second, I really appreciated the report that was given by Spencer with regard to the maritime 
and what we do for the communities. And the one thing he touched upon is how important aerospace is, and I looked at the jobs and stuff, and I think if the state legislature can have a special session and do so much for uh, the aerospace, uh, we're not asking for a special session. We're asking for during the regular session <laughs> have a transportation package so we can not only maintain what we have but grow what we have. That's all. Once again. Thank you. <laughs> I, I can concur with Dick. I really enjoyed uh, Spencer's uh, report and anxious to get a copy of that. And I really want to thank the uh, port staff for reemphasizing the importance of safety and people going home with all their parts and, and working their whole career in a safe, safe manner. Thank you. Uh, yeah, we're embarking on a new year with a lot of new opportunities and new challenges. And I think all of you who came today are commended for your interest and your zeal and your passion. And I think the port over the years has expended tens of millions of dollars for the improvement and preservation of the environment. And I don't see us making decisions that will uh, that will uh, impact negatively on that. Um, at, at the same time, we need to do our job, and um, sometimes those things clash, but we're, we're not there. So uh, thank you for coming, and um, I'm looking forward to a really productive year and lots of new things coming down the road. So, uh, One final comment that I have is, is in your package, you'll notice that uh, the PCRC talked about priorities. And completion of 167 is still the number one priority, but I want you to know there was also perhaps a lot of uh, pressure on the JBLM improvements, but if you run across any local officials, please make certain you thank them for yes. making certain completion of 167 remained as a top priority through PCRC, if you would. Thank you very much. Good. Great. Thank you to everyone for being here today, and I now call for the adjournment of this meeting. Thank you. Oh, thank you.